Philadelphia needs better public transportation that's easier to use, more convenient, and more comfortable. The city has changed, and transportation just hasn't kept up. Where people live and where they work has shifted. The system we have is outdated and patched together. And let's face it, it's holding us back as a city. Progress will require major disruption. Some people are on board, but many are not. It's Philadelphia in the 1850s, where technological innovation comes at a trot. This episode is all about the arrival of the horse-drawn streetcar. Don't be fooled. This early form of public transportation is a disruptive force. It ignites battles over the street. There are winners and there are losers. And in the end, we're all still living with the streets that the streetcar made. This is Found in Philadelphia, a podcast dedicated to telling the stories of Philadelphia's past so that we can better understand the present, because our history matters. I'm your host, Lori Almond. With each episode, I hope that you'll learn something new, see things a little differently, and be inspired to go discover some of this history for yourself right here in the city of brotherly love. This is the seventh episode in a series about the history of Philadelphia streets. In this episode, we're going to focus on Philadelphia during a short period of time, just seven years, between the consolidation of the city in 1854 and the outbreak of the Civil War in 1861. This was when the horse-drawn streetcar came to Philly streets, and it helped shape the city we have today. I also want to let you know about some Philly history efforts that you can support right now. A citizen group called Rename Taney, in alliance with the Young Chances Foundation, is working to remember civil rights activist and educator Carolyn LeCount. You may remember her from earlier episodes of the podcast. They're seeking support for two efforts. First, they need signatures to change the name of the current Taney Street to LeCount Street. Taney Street is named after Supreme Court Justice Taney, who handed down the Dred Scott decision. Even Taney's descendants support the name change. But they're also fundraising through GoFundMe to put a marker on Carolyn LeCount's grave in Eden Cemetery, which currently doesn't have one. I'll drop a link to these efforts in the episode notes. In the last episode, the newly consolidated city of Philadelphia, with the boundaries that we know today, had just emerged in 1854 after decades of terrifying and destructive violence. The original two square miles of the city, the area we call Center City today, was joined with the outlying areas of Philadelphia County to form one large, unified, metropolitan area of over 140 square miles. But in these early years, the expanded city still felt very much like a loose patchwork of smaller jurisdictions, not one connected city. Philadelphia's population was also expanding in the 1850s. The number of people living in this area would grow from over 400,000 before consolidation in 1850 to over half a million in 1860. That means the city's population grew by about 25% during that decade. And this population growth was changing the way the city looked. Recently arrived immigrants, mostly from Ireland and Germany, made up 30% of the city's population. And the city's black residents made up about 4% of the total population. This made Philadelphia unique because in these years before the Civil War, Philly was home to the largest black community outside of the South. And this continued to shape the city. Most of the city's residents lived in and around Center City in the river wards along the Delaware River, with more people moving into manufacturing centers, places like Maniunk, Germantown, Torsdale, and Bridesburg. The way these people were living in the city was changing too. Up until now, the dense urban core of Philadelphia had remained within a walkable distance to the Delaware River, which had been the economic engine of the old city. Residents crowded together in the densely packed streets that hugged the Delaware. But in the 1850s, Philly's urban grid of streets had filled out from the Delaware to the Schuylkill River and overflowed to the north and south. 
The overcrowded back alleys in the older sections of the city became less common. People were now living much more spread out than ever before. After Philly's consolidation in 1854, there wasn't a very efficient transit network to connect this new expanded city. Philadelphia was an important hub in a regional transportation system, but this broader system was built to bring goods and people from far afield to the edges of the city. It didn't connect areas within the city itself. Let's take a look at the transportation options that existed in the newly consolidated city in 1854. First, the city was part of an existing system of regional roads that followed the routes marked out by the Lenape many years before. Many of these roads had become a part of Pennsylvania's newly built system of turnpikes that led to and from Philadelphia. But these roads were notoriously bad, dusty in summer and treacherous in winter, and they were used primarily by farmers to bring goods into the city's many markets. Second, the docks along the Delaware continued to be an important port for water transportation. There's a wonderful sketch of these docks from 1850 that shows all kinds of vessels in motion, from canoes to small sailboats, and also massive creaking wooden ships with towering masts and webs of rigging. But there are also steam-powered boats belching black smoke. You can see small ferry boats puffing across from Camden, as well as huge white paddle boats propelling passengers up and down the river. Then there was the growing network of railroads. Philadelphia was a hub where many of these railroads converged, but didn't meet. There were at least eight different routes leading to the city from points northeast to southwest, plus two more railroad lines on the New Jersey side of the Delaware River that connected passengers to Philly by those puffing little ferry boats. Rail lines for freight cars had been built right through the center of the city, bringing goods along Broad and Market Streets, then down Third Street and along Dock Street to the Delaware River. But these center city rails didn't carry passengers. They were just for freight. And these early railroads had been built through private speculation. There'd been little coordination. So if you came in from the north as a passenger and wanted to continue to the south, you'd have to navigate through the city streets from one train depot to another. Once you got into the urban core of the city, most people still traveled by walking to where they needed to go on a daily basis. For the wealthier middle class, there was a form of horse-powered public transportation. At the time of consolidation, the city had around 320 privately run omnibuses running along 30 different routes. These large, bright yellow vehicles had been plodding along Philly's cobblestone streets since the 1830s, and they ran along a fairly organized system of standard routes. But according to contemporaries, these omnibuses were, quote, heavy, jolting, slow, and uncomfortable. These things lumbered along at two to five miles per hour, which is the average walking speed for a human. Omnibuses were also expensive to operate, requiring a team of two and sometimes four hefty workhorses to pull just one carriage. Fares were typically 10 or 12 cents, which is about $4 in today's money. And this was way too expensive for the majority of people to use on a daily basis, especially when it was just as fast to walk. So there was a pressing need to connect the expanded city and its growing population more efficiently to tie it all together. The answer to more efficient transportation in Philly seemed to be staring the city in the face. Remember those freight rail lines running through the center of the city? Well, merchants had been successful in their efforts to run these lines for freight through the city center, laying track down on Philly's major thoroughfares of Broad and Market Streets. These trains connected the warehouses and docks on the Delaware River to the larger regional rail network. Residents of the city drew the line at having those terrifying steam locomotives hissing and belching smoke on city streets. So the city of Philadelphia wouldn't allow steam locomotives to run through the city center. Instead, trains carrying freight would stop at the edge of the city center, the steam engines would be removed, and horses would be hitched up to pull the freight cars along the rails through the city. You just had to switch out freight cars with passenger cars, 
and the horse-drawn streetcar was born. New York City and New Orleans had built horse-drawn streetcar lines as early as the 1830s, but Philadelphia's first horse-drawn streetcars didn't start running until 1858, four years after consolidation. Here's our guide to the history of Philadelphia's streets, Michael Kahn, urban studies professor at Stanford University. In the 1850s, so a little before the Civil War, there were companies formed that want to place horse-drawn streetcars on the streets of Philadelphia. So they want to build these lines and have them be permanently placed in the street. And in order to do this, they need to get permission from the city and they need to get essentially exclusive use of the streets because you can't have, you know, two or three or four different lines running down a street the way you could with the original omnibuses. The streetcar companies demanded exclusive rights within the street in order to lay down their rails. Private companies were claiming a portion of the public street for their use. And it's important to remember that these companies weren't laying down a comprehensive system. They were often just creating one line at a time. The first streetcar line to be completed ran north and south along 5th and 6th Streets, from Burke Street in the north to Morris Street in the south. Its lines ran just a few blocks from the Germantown and Norristown Railroad Depot, so rail passengers could get off the train, walk a few blocks west, and then take a horse-drawn streetcar heading south towards Independence Hall. Philly streets were soon covered with these streetcar rails. Within three years, at the start of the Civil War, Philadelphia would have over 150 miles of track operated by 18 different chartered companies. Because Philadelphia was late to develop its streetcars, it was able to learn from other cities' mistakes. Streetcar rails were very similar to train rails, except that the area between the rails was paved with regular granite block pavers that were durable and gave the horses a good footing. From the beginning, Philly's streetcar rails were laid low enough to allow average wagons and carriages to cross over them. Rails were also laid down in widths that allowed other vehicles to use the tramway without harming their wheels. They could basically travel along in the same direction. Though this was never perfect, Philly's streetcar rails were much better integrated into the street than the railroad lines ever were. The main efficiency of streetcars came from the need for fewer horses. One or two horses were all that were needed to pull a light carriage running on rails. No more pulling all that weight over cobblestone streets. Fewer horses pulling more people meant they could charge lower fares. About five cents a ride or a dollar fifty today. Horse-drawn cars still only moved at top speeds of six miles per hour, only slightly faster than an omnibus. But the rails provided a much smoother, more civilized ride. And with lower fares, more people could ride the streetcars as a regular part of their day. The coming of the streetcar brought changes to long-standing street traditions in Philadelphia. The streetcars reignited battles about whose interests should prevail in the streets. These fights had already started with the railroads, but it exploded with the growth of the streetcars. We're going to focus on the way the streetcar hit Philly in two ways. First, we'll look at streetcars in the commercial center of Market Street. Streetcars helped the city redefine the primary business of a commercial street in a modern city. This pitted the city's long tradition of more informal businesses being run in the streets against big businesses who were interested in the efficient movement of people and goods through the same street. Second, we'll look at streetcars in the rest of the city where people lived. Streetcars provided a new front in the ongoing fight about whether streets were primarily controlled by private or public interests. Did private property owners have a say in what happened in their street right outside their door? Or was the street a public place to be used to serve the broader city interests, regardless of what neighbors wanted? These tensions are still very much at play in our streets today. 
Okay, round one, streetcars versus the open-air markets on Market Street. The battle for the streets was especially dramatic on Market Street, where the rails on the street had to compete with the popular market sheds that ran down the center of the street. There had been an open-air market in Market Street since Philadelphia was founded. By the 1850s, the situation was a kind of managed chaos, especially between 3rd and 8th Streets on Market. Here you had those freight cars being pulled down the railroad on Market Street by teams of horses, stopping at the mills and warehouses to load and unload. On market days, you also had official vendors rolling in with their wagons, loaded with goods to sell in the open-air market sheds that ran down the center of the street. But with all of the people coming to the market sheds, you also had hundreds of unofficial sellers jostling for the best spots to set up their wagons and wares to sell to the crowds in the streets and the sidewalks nearby. And now you had horse-drawn streetcar companies who wanted to lay rails along Market Street as well. There just wasn't room. City leaders looked on with dismay. They felt that the future of the city was being held hostage by the street market traditions of the past. While we may have trouble seeing the horse-drawn streetcar as a sign of civic progress, many people in the 1850s did. The mayor called the streetcars one of the most promising public improvements that the community had ever seen. The streetcar was modern. It offered a new form of mobility that hadn't existed before. Perhaps they saw the streetcar lines as a part of the larger railroad revolution in transportation, but they definitely saw streetcars as essential for business. Despite their popularity with the working class, the open-air market sheds were now seen as nuisances, literally standing in the way of progress. Many citizens pushed back against removing the market sheds, but while the city was fighting this opposition, they were already soliciting bids to demolish the sheds and granting a charter to the West Philadelphia Streetcar Company to lay tracks all the way down Market Street and on into West Philly. The West Philadelphia Streetcar Company started aggressively laying rails along Market Street in 1858, sometimes having to pull up sidings that led off from the railroad tracks. At the same time, the city started pulling down the market sheds block by block to make way for rails. By the time of the Civil War, four rail lines ran down Market Street along much of its length through Center City, two for the railroad and two for the streetcars. Market Street would now be a place for what the city called great commercial business, by which they meant the streetcar and railroad companies and the large manufacturing interests with warehouses and factories whose business was to move people and goods from one place to another. The small-scale street sellers who'd been using the street to run their businesses and supply goods to people since the city was founded, they just didn't count. Here is Michael Kahn to sum up this battle over Market Street. But as the city consolidates and begins to modernize and is really thinking of itself much more as this kind of center of trade and commerce, Again, the city leaders begin to find that the market houses in Philadelphia are blocking the flow of goods and passengers and pedestrians that Philadelphia needs to become a thriving urban center. So there is this building momentum, I would say, toward a, a more exclusive use of the streets for traffic. All right. Round two, streetcars versus private property owners. There were definitely valid safety concerns about streetcars running in neighborhoods where people lived and especially where kids played. It was difficult to bring the gliding streetcars to an abrupt stop and the city saw about one injury or death every 20 days from streetcar accidents. Streetcars posed an entirely new danger in the streets. But you also had private property owners who just didn't want changes to their streets. We might see them as 19th century NIMBYs, not in my backyard. I don't want a streetcar on my beautiful street, but I'll ride it on yours. But Philly residents had a long history of treating the street in front of their homes as an extension of their private property. Many times in the past, the city actually required property owners to pave and maintain the streets in front of their houses and many blocks would pull together to get water or gas lines installed in their street. 
So property owners did have a point when they argued that the city was trying to change this tradition. Here's Michael Kahn to tell us who wins this round. The fronters, that is the people who owned the property on these streets where the lines would go, objected very strongly. And in many cases, their objection was, these are our streets. We pay to have them paved. We own the property. We should be the ones who decide if there's a streetcar or not on our street. And the city effectively responds, no, they are not your streets. They're public good. They are the city's streets, and we get to decide what happens with them. And there's a lot of petitions back and forth, and there's some fights in the courts, but ultimately the city prevails, and the city's claim to control the streets is upheld. So we're 2-0 and with city leaders and the streetcars winning all around declaring victory for the modern city using its streets for public transit. Modernizing public transit, a way for citizens to get around a city, that's absolutely a public good, right? Well, streetcar development in the 19th century was deeply problematic. And I don't just mean problematic for us today. Philadelphians in the 1850s were seeing problems and calling them out in their day too. Many people objected to the city taking away the safe use of their streets and giving it away to private companies for their exclusive use and profit. There were concerns about private companies profiting off of public property while offering little value in return. One letter to the Enquirer in 1858 objected to the plan for a double set of streetcar rails down Arch Street. It asked, should taxpayers who help to move the wheels of our municipal government submit to enrich money-making corporations composed of a few individuals at the risk of not only decreasing the value of their own property, but of mutilating public and valuable thoroughfares for their private gain. Now, streetcar companies were supposed to contribute to the repair and maintenance of city streets, but that never really panned out. Here's Michael Kahn again. These private companies, part of the deal when they were given the right to build their tracks and run their lines and charge their fares, they agreed to keep those streets in good condition, that is to pave them. But they they never upheld that side of the deal. For decades, they would not do it because it would cost them money. And in fact, it was like subsidizing their competition. Why would they want to make the streets better for wagons and whoever was the alternative to taking the streetcars? So they did not do the paving that they were supposed to. So Philadelphia gave something up for sure by giving these private companies the right to use the streets. And streetcar companies were allowed to get away with it because it benefited those in power. Courts had upheld that the government should have control of the streets because they were a public good. But the government then used this right to give away lucrative charters to private companies in exchange for political support and maybe a bribe or two. Here's Michael Kahn to tell us what this moment meant. Now, what's ironic is that they use that power of public streets to now give a license to a private company to run a streetcar down the middle of the street. So you have the momentary sort of triumph of the idea that the street is a public space, but then immediately that's subverted by the kind of surrender of that right to a private company that's going to use the street for private gain. It's owned by stockholders, and the stockholders are going to be the ones to make the profits off of the operation of the cars on this public good. Another problem with the streetcars, they weren't really offering mass transit open to all. The streetcars of this era were segregated and they catered to citizens who were white and wealthy enough to be considered middle class. The very wealthy still had their carriages. Streetcars weren't built for them, but the cost of a ticket was really only available to the middle class on a regular basis. It cost too much for the working class to use streetcars for daily commuting, though the white working class could use the streetcars on special occasions, 
maybe to get out into the greener areas of the city. But when the working class got on the streetcar, they entered a space where the middle class set the standards for appropriate public behavior. This was supposed to be a safe space for wealthier white citizens, and everyone else was supposed to conform to their expectations. And Black people were excluded from riding the streetcars at all. Though this shouldn't be surprising in Philadelphia, which was an extremely segregated city. As Frederick Douglass noted, the line was tightly drawn between Black and white in Philadelphia. It's true that some streetcar drivers would allow Black passengers on board, but they were forced to sit up front on the outside platform exposed to the weather. So if you wanted to ride the streetcar, you had to be prepared for some form of humiliation. But Black Philadelphians fought against streetcar segregation from the beginning. William Still, secretary of the Philadelphia Vigilance Committee and the recorder of the Underground Railroad, wrote an open letter in 1859 protesting against the segregation of the streetcars. Still understood that the streetcars were designed for the upper classes, so he asked why it was in Philadelphia that respectable Black citizens should be excluded from the streetcar when they are, quote, taxed to support the very highways that they are rejected from. And in 1861, a Black resident brought a case against the streetcar company for excluding him from the streetcar, but he lost. Though this wouldn't be the last battle in that fight. So this was the state of Philadelphia on the brink of war in 1861. At the start of the Civil War, the consolidated metropolis was very much a work in progress. Philadelphia had become a regional transportation center, but the network was patched together using different railroad lines, steamboat connections, and ferry services that were all run by different companies. Most of these transportation lines stopped outside the city center at points north, south, east, and west. In between, the city offered privately run, horse-drawn streetcars. By 1861, the streetcar system covered much of the city center, reaching north to Lehigh and south to Jackson Street. Streetcar lines also branched out towards the older sections of the consolidated city and the growing area of West Philadelphia. And though it looked like a unified system, the streetcars were actually operated under 18 different private companies. And the horse-drawn streetcars were segregated, primarily serving the white, middle-class residents who were allowed to ride and could afford the fare. We often like to blame the automobile for taking over our streets for the exclusive use of traffic. But I would argue that the coming of the horse-drawn streetcar was a significant turning point in the surrender of our streets to private vehicles. In the 1850s, the city of Philadelphia gave away the public right to the street to private companies for their exclusive use. And by segregating the streetcars and charging high enough fares, the streetcars prioritized the efficient movement of a privileged group of people through the public street. The streetcar rails physically marked out this special private streetcar space all over the city streets. In many ways, these 19th century streetcar rails still run through our streets today, marking out a right of way on our public streets that's now used for driving and parking cars the majority of which are privately owned for the exclusive use of a few. We'll see how Philadelphia, this patched together city with its problematic transportation system, fares during the Civil War in the next episode. Thank you for listening to the Found in Philadelphia podcast. If you're enjoying this series, please drop me a review and share the podcast with a friend. And please check out the podcast website to learn more see some historic images, and find a list of my sources. This podcast was researched, written, hosted, and recorded by me, Laurie Almond. So all mistakes are my own. Cyril Tayendi is the audio engineer and leads the Community Recording Collective at Drexel University. 